Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you've had a great sort of day one at SRECon already, and welcome to the SRE classroom. My name's Ryan Thomas. I'm an engineering manager in SRE at Google in Sydney, Australia, and myself, JC, and um, Macy are going to be doing the presentations for you today, and we're going to be breaking out into groups a bit later. So the things we want to cover off today are what are the basics of what we call NALSD, that is non-abstract large system design. And the non-abstract part of it is key here, and that's what we want to get through. By the end of today, after we've gone through our group work, our session, ideally we will have a design for a distributed system that you have on the handouts in front of you, as well as, key, a bill of materials for how we could actually go and build that system. So before we crack on with this, You've got the handout in front of you. There's a link at the end of this, which will give you both the slides as well as some further reading on this. We're going to be doing group work later. So you've got numbers on your seat which define which group you're going to move into. And the key thing here is that we all come from a wide range of experiences, a wide range of backgrounds and experience with technology. So try to be as inclusive as possible for everyone within the group and work together to come to this solution. So. Let's cover off the basics, of, or some of the basics, of distributed systems. Well, obviously we can't cover off everything related to it, so there's four key areas I want to go into today. There's plenty of other talks, both here at the conference and published online, that you'll be able to see to uh, go over it, things in further detail, if you so wish. The four things I'd like to cover off today, in, at the start of this session, are really how do we deal with requirements of distributed systems and scaling them based on those requirements? Failure, what happens then and how we actually design around that and mitigate those? How we manage state in our distributed systems? As well as the non-abstract part of this non-abstract large system design. How do we take that design and actually get the, the, machine, the number of machines we need to implement this at the end of the day? So, Requirements and scaling. You'll see that on your handout there, we've got our problem definition for an image service. We have a number of SLIs and SLOs. Now, if you're not familiar with the term SLI or SLO, it stands for service level indicator and service level objective. Now, an indicator is something we would like to measure. In this case, in the example slide here, we have latency, we have freshness, and we have availability. We then couple that with some target we would like to meet. We take our service level indicator with a target, and that becomes our service level objective. The example we have here is the 99th percentile latency for successful cases is less than 100 milliseconds. We can take it a step further and move it into an SLA, but we're not going to talk about SLAs, the service level agreement, further on in these slides, because that is really the business agreement, the contractual agreement you may have, as well as some sort of punitive measure or, or compensation should you fail to meet that SLO. So we want these SLIs and the SLOs that we have, that we've got in our handout there, to drive the design of our system. We don't want to spend all of the money we have to build the best possible system. You know, maybe we can get our um, return latency down to 50 milliseconds or something like that. But why do we want to do that if we don't need to, if the customer doesn't require this? So defining our SLOs is going to be more of an iterative process, going through it, seeing what works, what doesn't work, to actually sort of finalize what we want to have for our objective. And this should then drive how we design our system. Do we need a caching layer? Is the user happy with just hitting the disk every single request that comes in? Maybe they are. Maybe we don't need to pay for all that flash or in-memory cache. That's, you know, that, that's a question you need to make and a trade-off you need to make in your design there. We also want to make sure that when we're designing our system, we're not just designing for the current state of the world. Hopefully your service, your image-based service, is going to be you know, the up and to the right curve. It's going to be amazing. And we want to think about you know, what's going to happen when we 10x our traffic. Is the current design going to hold up? And that's not to say, can I host 10x the traffic on the current amount of machines I have, but can I scale the design I have to, to handle 10x traffic? These are, these are things to keep in mind. So one of the ways we can go about scaling is, pardon me, is 
by decomposing monolithic binaries into microservices. Now, microservices really came into sort of vogue about, what, six, seven years ago, but they've existed long before that. I know I'm probably not the only one here that has a huge, huge amount of sort of trauma and experience with monolithic binaries. The old, you know, every team gets together, they push their releases, they schedule the testing, they schedule the acceptance testing that goes to pre-prod, prod, and then you deploy this massive binary to your special blessed single production instance, very much like the, the Indiana Jones with the idol and the bag of sand, quickly swapping it over and, and crossing your fingers and hoping that nothing goes wrong. By decomposing it into microservices, we get the advantage of um, not only having services that do you know, the standard Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it well, but we also take the failure domain down from you know, our single blessed prod machine that has all of the traffic, and that is our blast radius when things go wrong and things do go wrong, down to a much smaller blast radius of just the single task when, when, you know, if you push a bug or you hit a query of death or things like that. So we generally scale these by, you know, you throw a load balancer in front of it, you independently scale the functionality of it, and we horizontally scale out each service. Now, again, more advantages are you can provide a service-based interface. You know, inside of Google, we use an internal tech called Stubby, uh, which is basically protobufs with a few other bits of magic sprinkled in. But there's tons of tech there, you know, um, gRPC, Thrift, Cap'n Proto, you could use HTTP and JSON. The point being that if you provide this consistent service interface, it doesn't matter what language the um, service is written in the back end. Your teams can independently build, release, push them out to production, and as long as you provide that interface there. In our example here on the slides, we can see that we could imagine that microservice A is maybe our, our hot path, our image serving pipeline that we have for our example. You know, it's, so we scale it out, we, we put more instances up to be able to handle the load to meet the SLO that we've defined in the document there. Microservice C, maybe it's something less used, maybe it's GDPR takeout data or so, something like that, that you, know, you require to have it, but it's a much less used process. So we don't scale it as much. So when we talk about scaling in distributed systems in this session, it's going to generally refer to horizontal scaling. That is, adding more machines for the one service to scale it out, generally commodity machines. If you've dealt with monoliths in the past, you'll know that the story is generally vertical scaling, that is, a bigger box, a bigger box. And I've seen it you know, actually happen. You know, the, the service gets to a certain point, and you're like, well, I need a bigger box. Yeah? I need a bigger box. And then you eventually get to a point where either a, you can't afford another box, the bigger box, or B, there is no bigger box for the service to go on, and then you end up having some reasonably sort of difficult and confronting conversations with a number of people about that. There are a number of other types of scaling that we, we need to talk about today. Geographical scaling, that is, if I have my 100 millisecond SLO for latency that I require things to have, maybe I physically can't meet that for my customers in Asia or my customers in Europe. Maybe I need to take my service and put it physically closer to those users. And you know, when we talk about geographical scaling here, that is maybe, you know, let's throw a data center in Asia, let's throw a data center in Europe. And when we think about this conceptually, it is just the same as horizontally scaling a microservice, but instead of the task level, the single service level, you're dealing with it at the data center level. When we talk about functional scaling, the canonical example I always go back to for this is imagine you're running a service that does um, speech to text, voice recognition type, type work. You can imagine your data center in Asia, your data center in Europe, and your data center in the US are going to have very different load profiles for the actual feature sets that are being used, that being the languages being recognized. Again, we could imagine that we have microservices for each different language for the recognition, and we can horizontally scale those as required. The point being is that all of these things come back to generally horizontal scaling, the, the one true scaling. So how do we deal with failure inside of these distributed systems here? Well, failure is not an option. We've all heard that before. In this case, it is a certainty. We know things are going to fail. Like, I, I, I don't know if anyone here can put up their hand and say they've never seen a failure in production. Wait, is there anyone? No, okay. <laughs> But you know, for everything from you know, 
the machine dying, the disk dying, the rack dying, the top of rack switch, the, the, the core switch, anything like that can die. I've seen data centers just disappear and go offline, okay? All of these failures can happen. And the, the, the way we want to work is we want to build in the resilience to our system to make sure that when these failures do happen, not if, but when they do happen, we can continue to serve. We can continue to have our product work. Maybe it works in a degraded state. The last two points on the slide here are you know, somewhat connected. I'm sure most of the people in the room here have either done it themselves or seen it, where you push and you release to production, there's a bug, you have to roll back or you roll forward or something like that, okay? All of the servers running the same binary is really, if we push that all at once, we're no better than that monolithic case of doing the old Indiana Jones and the idle swap, okay? We generally want to roll these out in a staged fashion, and it is really worth the investment to invest in canary infrastructure and to roll it out in a sane stage fashion, you know, 1%, 10%, 50%, 100% of a data center, and then do that again in the next DC. Global configuration is, you know, unfortunately we can't um, not have it. You know, at some point your, a, a request needs to make its way into, into your system somehow. So all we want to do is generally limit as much as we put into global and um, to limit that blast radius there. So when something fails, it is the, the minimal amount that is actually failing. So how do we deal with that? Well, maybe we just make it someone else's problem. Why, you know, thanks everyone, that's it. Just hand it over to GCP, AWS, or Azure and make it someone else's problem. Well, yes, that is, that is a solution, but you still need to be aware of how systems fail. Those systems are not gonna give you 100% availability. Okay, if anyone tells you that they can give you 100% availability, I would be very skeptical about that. If you ever watch Futurama, the bender, the robot in that, he's like, I can guarantee you anything you want. It's, it's very similar to that, so I'll be very skeptical about that. If you are going to rely on these services, it's important to understand how they're gonna fail and how they're going to degrade. And it's very easy to you know, go in and work yourself into single points of failure. I've seen plenty of times, maybe you're an AWS customer, maybe you use S3, and it's very easy just to stick everything in the US East One S3 bucket and you know, call it a day. So we need to be aware of the limitations that are here. For the exercise you're going to be doing today, we're not gonna be deferring to someone else, we're not gonna be making it someone else's problem, it's your problem today. Otherwise this would be a very quick and easy classroom. So how do we do this? Well, we want to decouple the responsibility. That is, move away from that monolith and reduce the blast radius when things do fail. Now, there can be other failure modes that we have seen. So, you know, our microservices sit behind a load balancer. Maybe there's some request profile that causes your binary to segfault. You know, that's not ideal, a query of death of something. The load balancer is going to sit there and do its dutiful job and balance these requests. When a user gets an error, they're generally going to Let's refresh the page. And we can see how that failure is going to, you know, bang, 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 go through every single um, task you have there, possibly kill it. Worse if it's an automated system. This can then bubble up to, you know, uh, your global load balancer can look, oh, this, this data center's not looking healthy, I'd better redirect the traffic somewhere else. Same thing. So neither microservices nor the monolith sort of protect against that. There's other mitigations you can put in place. But the idea is that you want to limit the blast radius just to the functionality of that rather than killing all of your traffic because of a single bug that's rolled out. I mentioned the canary before and the worthwhile investment to put into making sure you have decent canary infrastructure there. That is, you don't want to get a new release and just upgrade everywhere and you know, cross the fingers and, and hope it all works. You have some infrastructure to go that 1%, 10%, 50 100%, what, what, whatever mechanism you want to use inside of a data center, and then do that again in another data center and again until it's rolled out everywhere. I talked about the S3 bucket. You want to spread your risk. You don't want to def depend on a single backend. You don't want to build in single points of failure to your system. Well, you, you want to try to avoid that, okay? And of course, we want to degrade gracefully. Um, when, when I started at Google, I was working on um, Google Search, and it has a massive amount of backends. So when a request comes in, it gets fanned out to tons of things. And often, well, not, not terribly often, but you know, sometimes those requests would you know, come in and they'd just go out to lunch. We'd hit a backend and it just never comes back. But the point is we don't return a 500 to the user. 
you know, we're talking about backends like suggest, personalized suggest, um, the sports scores, the weather, things like that. What we do is we still return the results. It's just you might not get that part of the functionality when the results page is rendered. So we want to degrade gracefully. And this is really dependent on whether or not your service can do it. But we don't want one single task of the microservice backend that you're hitting to die and cause you know, the user to, you know, the, the whole thing to fall over. Okay, we can put in requests or, I'm um, sorry, retries or anything like that. Inside of Google, the general rule for services that have been run is to run it at n plus two, where n is defined as your sort of peak load over, and, and it depends on organization, but how you measure that, but it's defined as your, um, your, your load, okay? So if it takes a single data center to run your um, service, you generally want to deploy three of them. And this is because, you know, we have planned maintenance, you know, maybe your service requires the data center to be drained to upgrade it. You know, there are you can't do a sort of live hot upgrade there. And then, of course, we have that unplanned stuff. You know, when the, when the entire data center goes out to lunch or you get a partial failure or someone comes in and trips over a power cord and the rack goes offline and, and things like that, that, like, these things do happen. You know, we can't, we can't um, stop failure happening there. We can just mitigate our response to it and, and make sure that we can continue to serve. Now, services may, be, um, may require higher availability, or in order to meet your SLOs that you've defined for the service, maybe you need to run it much more than N plus two. Okay, in order, maybe you have a 50 millisecond um, return latency, something like that, and you need to put it just closer to the customer. So you need to run it at a, um, at a higher reliability. Now, the thing to be cautious of here is if you're running three data centers at N plus two and the requests are spread evenly over them, at peak, you're gonna be looking at, what, about 33% utilization for each data center. And these become very easy targets to say, well, I could, I could save a bit of money and just put, you know, don't need to scale anything, I can just serve more traffic from it. You know, if you go to 66% utilization at each of them, all things being equal, you're now at M plus one, okay? So you can lose a single data center and you'll be at peak and you can't, you know, what are you gonna do there? Like, it, it's not a nice place to be in. So it's just something to be aware of. So when we talk about state and, um, in, inside of the distributed systems, I always try to pr prefer um, stateless services. Much like if you're you know, writing code, like a pure function is much easier to test and to um, verify than say a function, a non-cons function that comes in, ver mutates a whole bunch of local and global state. That, that, that's just messy, but everything can't be stateless. Generally prefer it is, is my tip, but everything can't be. And requiring that state requires some form of coordination. And in order co to coordinate things, we need to make sure that each service has a consistent view of the world. And you'll need to, be a, you'll need to use some of these things inside of um, the exercise we're going to do today. So as I said, this is critical for large systems, getting this consistency. How do we find, say, a leader? How do we perform locking or leader election? You know, when the leader goes away, how do we elect a new one? All of these things need to be done with some sort of um, consistency, um, say again, some sort of consensus algorithm. There's a bunch of them out there, you know, publicly there's Raft, so if you've used etcd, that uses the Raft algorithm for it. If you haven't done so, go and take a look at the Raft paper. It is extremely accessible. It's like about two pages long, and it's something you can go and, you know, actually code up yourself in about a day. So it's, it's, not, it's not a huge amount of work there. It's very simplistic. Paxos is the other one. It is somewhat less accessible, it's a fairly dense paper, I, I wouldn't recommend reading it. We use Paxos internally at Google primarily because, you know, we started doing it before Raft became, became a thing. Um, we, have, we have a service called Chubby, there's a paper on it, it do, it's basically etcd. Of course, other things like Zookeeper, using the Zookeeper algorithm, things like that. But using services like this to provide this global, sort of this con consistent view of the world is basically critical for both our load balances, for service discovery, all, all those parts of the world. And whenever we talk about this, me, we talk about CAP theorem. That is consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. Pick two, generally. So things are gonna break, things aren't gonna be reliable. In this example, we talk about networks. You know, network partitions are rare, but they still do happen. And when they return, can you converge after that? Can your service converge? That is what we talk about there in the partition tolerance. 
Spanner is a Google service that we, um, that we provide publicly. It provides the availability and partition tolerance for users with eventual consistency. And what that means is you, know, you as a consumer of Spanner, you can provide it a, um, a parameter to say, you know, how stale can the reads be when I read? And if you say, I don't want them to be stale at all, then you need to um, converge with all of the replicas in the set to actually get the result back. For the data, we want to make sure we don't put, you know, a, a very simple way of storing things is, for a given user in our image serving service, maybe we just put all of their data on the one disk. Now, what are the problems there? Well, maybe the user shares a photo and it becomes popular on Twitter, Reddit, things like that, and we end up smashing the disk, okay? Maybe the rest of their photos get seen and we end up smashing the disk. So we've got to look at sharding that over multiple machines, both so, so we can meet the, the um, SLOs that we define, as well as the, the throughput we require to, to access it. And this can be done, shard it by user, shard chunks out of the file itself, many different ways. The point is that we need to let our SLOs drive the requirements here. Maybe the user is happy with, maybe we can meet our SLOs by hitting the disk every single time a request comes in. You know, that is a possibility, but it's up to you. Generally, it, like, it won't be in this case. So one way we can work around this is by actually caching the data. And there's a number of different ways we can cache things. Maybe your microservice has an in-memory cache, pardon me, for actually managing the, the data itself. Maybe you've got a cache on the side that it talks to, you know, using flash or just an in-memory cache. Otherwise, maybe it sits further up in the request chain and the back end doesn't even see the request when it comes in. These are all different techniques and they all come with different trade-offs. You know? Ideally, you want to put the data as close to the user as you want, but if you're caching right at the edge, then how do you invalidate things there? How do you manage it? So they're all trade-offs we, um, we, we need to make. There's a point here on the slide between the capacity and a performance cache. So performance cache, we, is, we put it in place and it will improve our performance. It'll bring in the tail a bit of you know, our latency, for example, and that's fine. A capacity cache, on the other hand, is something we put in place in order to serve more requests. And there's, there's not a huge problem with using it, it's just you need to be aware of the, the trade-offs here, in that if we calculate additional load based on the cache, what happens when the cache is cold? What happens when we push a new release and it changes the way we hash the keys? What happens if we just globally invalidate the caches? Are we still going to be able to serve the traffic? So these are just things to be aware of. The general rule we use is that we don't factor capacity caches into our SLO traffic calculations. On the non-abstract side of things, we want to, at the end of this, the whole purpose of this exercise is to both design a distributed system and come out at the end with a bill of materials for the machines we've given you as to how you would actually go about building this. For this, we want to look at, you know, what is the bottleneck? What throughput can I get from each task of the services that I run? You know, what is the limiting factor there? Is it disk I.O.? Is it CPU time? Is it the NIC? What is gonna be the limiting factor there? And so you can calculate this based on the numbers we've given you in the sheet, based on the um, SLO requirements as well. But you can calculate this to work out what the maximum throughput is, what the, max, the tail latency is going to be for the services, and then you can calculate how many machines you actually need, how many machines you need to run to meet the SLO that we have here. Now for the exercise, you're free to use sort of round numbers, 25 hours, 30 days if you want. You're also free to use the exact numbers. Most of us probably have phones. The phones probably have calculators on them. You, you, can, you can get there using that. So what I'm gonna do now is hand over to JC. JC's gonna come up and go through the problem statement we have for you that you're gonna then break off into groups. You've got numbers on your chair. That'll represent your group number. Please go to the bits on the wall, there's more out in the corridor once we break into the groups to form your group, and, um, and yeah, we'll crack on. So I'll hand over to JC, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Ah, uh -huh. now I can. Um, good, we're going to look at the problem statement and we're going to make this slightly more non-abstract. Uh, we have been talking about a lot of 
theory and what are uh, ways to design a system. Now it's your chance to actually practice this. Um, and as you will see later, we will have people from Google walking around groups and you can ask them questions if you are stuck or, or want some extra information. Good, so let's look at our problem. What are we going to design? Um, do you know this thing called Flickr or um, Imager? We have the next best thing, the next new thing. We want you to design a photo serving system uh, for, in the beginning, just a million people. It's, it's not that big yet. Um, and every user will be uploading 50 photos a day. They, they are very touristy and take a lot of pictures. For now, it's going to be very simple. We only have two pages, a thumbnail view with 10 thumbnails and a photo view with the detail of a large scale photo. The big photos are four megabytes when people upload them and the thumbnail we thumbnail it down to 256 uh, kilobytes. Of course, people must be able to search. They can search based on user, uh, the newest ones, uh, topical ones, or via hashtag. We will, in this um, exercise, not look at authentication uh, and, and so on. So no identity and uh, access management. Just assume that people are logged in and that we know they are the people they say they are. Now, people are going to use this and it's going to be a great success, I hope, but people will not like it if the service is too slow. Now, what does too slow mean? If you get a page and it says your service is too slow, do you have any information? No, so therefore we must set SLOs. And the SLOs that we set, the server level, service level objectives, are that we can serve the page with the 10 thumbnails within 250 milliseconds for the 99.9th percentile. So it's okay if 0.1 of a percent of traffic comes after 15 seconds. Hopefully not, but um, the image page, the 1.4 megabyte full resolution page, uh, should be there within 200 milliseconds, also at the 99.9th percentile. Um, these SLOs are only valid, or we only set them, for photos that are 30 days or younger. Older photos, they can take a longer time to show up. Yeah. What do we have to help you build this? Um, well, we have a network uh, that is four nines available, 99.99% .99 availability. We have a storage system for you that can read uh, in 100 milliseconds at the 95th percentile and within 200 milliseconds writes at the 95th percentile. Now, the storage system does a lot of stuff for us, and that's very fortunate. It also handles downsampling. Um, thank you. So we don't have to think about uh, the CPU power that is required for the downsampling. Um, it also provides the thumbnails on request. The storage system, of course, is globally replicated, meaning that um, if a disk fails, it will still be there somewhere. Uh, it is eventually consistent in the order of minutes. Uh, and that is because actually the data centers that we store stuff in are in three locations in Europe, in Asia, and North America. Each of the data centers, these data centers, is unavailable for one week a quarter. We, we do aggressive uh, new hardware rollouts, so we take everything out of the data center and put completely new machines in there. It's, it's super shiny. Uh, but that means that we lose the data center for one week every quarter. Um, and of course, apart from us taking a data center down, you never know what Mother Nature does. Um, we have seen events with hurricanes coming over uh, data centers where the data center had to be turned down, or if a backhoe um, pulls up some uh, networking. All these things can happen, so 
We know for sure that the data center will be down every quarter for a week. Some things may happen. So what do we have in these data centers? In the data centers, we have two kinds of machines. We have machines with hard disks. They have 24 gigs of RAM, eight cores, and two two terabyte hard disks, and 10 gigabit ethernet. Instead of the hard disk machines, we also have SSD machines. Um, the same amount of RAM, same amount of core, number of cores, 24 gigs of RAM, eight cores, and two one terabyte SSDs. Now, of course, the SSDs are slightly faster. Uh, the same ethernet is here. Um, these data centers are humongously big. Uh, you can use as many machines as you want. However, at some point, someone has to pay for them. So you want to have the lowest number of machines that you can actually get away with. But for now, you, can, you don't have to think about, but we can use at most 15 machines because we only have 15 machines in the data center. There are many, many, many machines. You just want to keep the number low if you can. So what are we going to do in uh, the rest of this session? Um, you are going to form groups, not just now, but you are going to form groups. And uh, in these groups, you are going to try and find a solution for the pro uh, problem statement that we have here. Um, you will get sticky notes, you will get markers, and we have put out uh, flip charts on the walls and also in the hallway over there so that you can have a discussion and draw out boxes and uh, do math about how many of what kind of boxes you want. Um, one hint, it is easier to start this problem by using just one data center and then once you have that thought out, scale it up to multiple data centers. If you start with three data centers at the beginning, then the problem suddenly becomes more complex to reason about straight from the start. Uh, so do it for one data center and then do some math. Can we actually meet our SLO with this? Uh, given the number of uploads of photos and the amount of time that we need to write to a disk, how many disks are we going to need? How much? traffic can one disk do. By the way, you have gotten numbers about how fast uh, things are. Um, some of these numbers may not e entirely be the truth, um, but they have been put there in such a way that it's easier for you to do the math with. Um, once you have it for one data center and you believe that one data center can actually uphold the SLO, then you can expand it for multiple data centers. And then, of course, you still have to keep your SLO. Once you have that, you can do the math and think, how many machines do I need? Um, where do I put all those machines in, in what different sizes? So we finally get a bill of materials, and you can come with your proposal to the big boss and say, we need 15,000 machines for this service, or whatever the number is. We don't need a perfect solution. And actually, it is impossible to come up with a perfect solution because we don't have enough time for that. And by the way, every solution that one comes with is imperfect. Uh, and it's always possible to nitpick or to start bike shedding about final details. Don't do that. Um, use back of the envelope style reasoning and do easy math. Um, like Ryan said. And yes, you can p take out your pocket calculator, um, your, your phone to, to do the math, but you know, there are some numbers that are easy to remember. Uh, there are 100,000 seconds in a day, so that's just a, t a one with five zeros. That's easier to think with than uh, 86,400. You don't need a, a laptop. As a matter of fact, I would say don't use your laptop. Um, this is um, a, a exercise that requires you to think. It, it, you don't have to come with the exact results. It's a reasoning exercise and it's a group exercise. You work in groups, the Google facilitators will walk by. Um, 
your group number is on the tiny little piece of paper um, that you have in front of you. The flip charts are numbered in the same way. So when I say yes, not now, when I say yes, then you can go and find your group uh, and maybe because I do see some small number cards uh, in front here. Maybe we will have to rearrange a bit. Uh, please be prepared for that. The facilitators will come by and talk with you and listen to what you say and maybe ask some questions that will trigger you to maybe go a slightly different direction. Please see this as a fun exercise. This is not a test. This is not an interview. This is just having fun and learning from each other uh, in the experience of designing such a large system. So have fun and I would say go to your flip chart. There, there are markers in the front here. Markers in the front. Hi everyone and welcome back. We're going to be kicking off again and we're going to be continuing this exercise until 12. So we've got another hour to work on this and at 12 Macy will then get up and be presenting our example solution. Enjoy. Now if I could ask everyone to start finalising their designs. We've got about two more minutes and then we're going to be seated again for Macy to present our example solution. Right, thank you very much everyone. So I hope you got some value out of that and actually, you know, I don't, I'm not sure how many teams made it to the solutions, um, to a solution that is. I I've saw, you know, in my wandering around, a lot of good stuff happening and a lot of good discussion. But now I'm gonna hand over to Macy. Macy's gonna present an example solution um, for this problem as well as the bill of materials. Thank you. Hello. All right, let me make sure that my microphone is audible and in, Hands up, who loves audiovisual technology? <laughs> okay, can everyone still hear me? No. How about now? Yes, no, hands at the back. That's a thumbs up at the back. That's a hand wavy from Dieter at the back. Okay, there's a thumbs up from Dieter even. There we go. Ah, slides. All right, so who's awake? That's some, some, we're doing well. It's what, it's lunchtime, everyone's hungry. Yes, at least one person's hungry, good, good. Um, who had fun? Yeah? Who met some cool people who had different ways of thinking about the problem? Right? Like for me, that's my favorite part of exercises like this, when we force you into contact with strangers against your will. It's a good reflection of your work life, sure, I'm sure, but I will stop stalling now that I have slides. Okay, so disclaimers. Um, some parts of this problem were, as you may or may not have noticed, underspecified. Yeah? Um, who had some questions about that? Like, that's somewhat on purpose, right? We don't want to we want to be true to life, and how many of you have ever had a spec that was 100% complete and accurate? Anyone? Anyone? I know they exist. I'm told they exist. Anyway, so this is going to be an example solution. It is going to make some assumptions about the problem, which may not be the assumptions that you made. So there are very good reasons to have different designs. Some of it's just what you choose to do. Some of it is that we will have made different decisions about the axioms of the problem. For example, we live in a fantasy world where disc seeks take two milliseconds. <laughs> yeah? I'm gonna play along with that one. It'll be fine. So, here is a quick sketch of an example solution. One of the axioms that we talked about earlier was the idea of having microservices that do one thing well. So, a good way to split up this problem is to ask what are the flows that users are actually interacting with our system through? And there's really three main use cases, right? You are uploading a picture, you are looking at a thumbnail from a search, or you are trying to download one single picture, like one big image. So we're gonna break up our service into these three main boxes. We are then going to back it with a data store, 
And for the purpose of fetching the thumbnails that are linked to a particular user or a hashtag, we're going to have an index service. And we'll also use that to tell our downloaders where to go to fetch their image. So does this look something like maybe what you came up with? It might not. That's fine, too. We're just going to talk about this as a example. So first off, we have the upload service. This is the first things that your user is going to do. It's also a pretty simple one to think about and to talk about. Um, all it does is it accepts the images, it streams them through the storage, and it indexes them so you can find them again later. Then we have the thumbnail service. This is a little bit more advanced. Um, it has to understand your user's query. It has to have some concept of time. It's fetching the 10 latest for that particular hashtag or that particular user, whatever your index is based on. Um, so that's going to use the index server to maintain that so that our thumbnail service can be stateless and uh, be kind of low footprint. And then we have the download service, uh, which serves back the picture data retrieves it from the storage and uh, does the lookup to find out where it lives. It doesn't have to know exactly the index of your storage server on the download service itself. Again, we're trying to keep these simple, stateless, lightweight. One of the real benefits of having these separate services is if your user pattern shifts over time, you can scale them separately. Right? If some people start using you as a web hosting service and like linking directly to your images, and suddenly you've got a torrent of single image download, you can scale that independent of the thumbnail service when your infrastructure is split like this. Um, we can talk a little bit more about caching later. I'm going to run through a very simple overview. Uh, this is a service with a perfectly spherical, frictionless user base. Right? They live in a vacuum. It's going to be great. They all query at precisely the same time, but like they each have a timestamp, and they're like, exactly separated from each other, so you'll have perfectly uniform query flow at all times, right? Who would like to work on a service like that? Yeah, tell me about it. Anyway, onwards. Yes, index server, we are assuming a metadata size of eight kilobytes. Um, this is something we didn't give you. Uh, I've seen estimates from like one kilobyte to like Anything that's in the like, lowish kilobytes range is probably reasonable. This is just going to be index data strings. Uh, there's not going to be a ton there. But that lets it be um, updated very fast and quick to fetch. So that was this is an abstract large system design. Uh, these things are easy to whiteboard, easy to think about, and easy to talk. This is not an abstract large system design class. This is a non-abstract large system design class. What does it cost? So we like to play with numbers in this class. Um, we're going to start out with the basic overview numbers. You will note that we gave you kind of the building blocks of the numbers that you really needed for this problem. But then you had to put the building blocks together to get useful information. So how do we do that? We are thinking in QPS here. Uh, I've seen a lot of systems use queries per day or request per day, queries per hour, request per hour. One of the benefits of using the query per second metric is that you can compare it really nicely to things like network, things like disk seek. Uh, it's easy in your head to be like, oh, a thousand milliseconds is a second. I can two milliseconds. I can kind of feel how many disk seeks I can do in that time. So. If we're talking a million daily users with 50 uploads each, um, multiply that through. I'm not going to read all the numbers. You guys can read. Talking around 579 QPS, I would tend to round that up to 600 QPS. Um, data uploaded per day, 191 terabytes um, for 30 days, because we're only keeping the data for 30 days in this scenario, 5.59 petabytes. One of the axioms that was not on your sheet is that we are not going to be trying to provision machines to host this. We're using our storage layer for that. Um, and so we're not going to be calculating the bill of sales for how many machines it would take to store petabytes of data right now. Um, it's another one of those assumptions that we might want to document somewhat better. So we're assuming that users are doing five searches per user organically. That's probably kind of low, honestly. Um, and we're also assuming that that's uniform across the hours of the day. Go with us here. No one in this world sleeps 
um, and no one is located in different countries from one another, it's fine. So we're estimating about 58 queries per second and assuming that each search, everybody then goes through the thumbnails and clicks on precisely one large image. So that'll also be 58 queries per second to your full image download. The upload service is something that you can calculate fully from the numbers that we gave you. So before I get into the details of the individual services, let's pause for a second and talk about how we decide what physical hardware we need for a given server. So I'm gonna skip back in a, for a second to get a picture of this service. We have five different services here. We're really gonna talk about sizing four of them. Um, each of these is going to have a bottleneck resource, right? In some systems that were higher CPU and higher processing based, we might be talking about how many CPU seconds we have to do the processing. Right now, for our image upload and download, we're going to be dominated by three main things. We're gonna be dominated by network to get the data from where it is to where it needs to be. We're gonna be talking about storage. How much space do we have for the information we are storing and processing and passing around? And we're gonna be talking about timing. So input, output, how long do things take? and how many milliseconds does it take for each of them, which implies how many can we do per second. These servers are going to be bottlenecked by different ones of these constraints, and so we're gonna walk through each of those constraints and see where the bottleneck lies. So, the bandwidth of the upload service is the first place we're gonna start. How much network does it take to get four megs per picture times 579 pictures per second into your data center and into your servers. So multiplying that out, we're talking about 2,300 uh, 2, megs per second. And if you divide that through by the network cards that we gave you, we gave you NICs that could take 1,000 megabytes per second. So we're talking about 2.3 network cards. And uh, Ryan is making faces at me. That's what we gave them. We don't promise this has any bearing on reality. We're giving you very rounded numbers here. Sometimes it's easier to think about the numbers the other way around. Rather than saying, um, we have this many queries, how many of that resource do we need? You can ask, we have one of those resources, how many queries can it do? That's actually a good way to look at it when you are looking at an existing service that's scaling up to ask like how many more do I need to add? If I add 250 queries, I need to add a new NIC. So if you look at four megabytes per query incoming um, and 1,000 megs per card, you can say that every 250 QPS I add, I have to add a new server with a new network card. So we've started out needing three servers just for networking inbound. Is that our only constraint? Well, no. Um, if we are writing through to this database, this storage system that we told you about on our sheets, uh, we can stream those in parallel. I would not recommend blocking on writing to your storage system. You could choose to do that if it was highly compact data that was extremely sensitive or important. I wouldn't do it for Flickr images, you know? Um, so storage write takes 200 milliseconds, but that's not all clock time, right? We're not only going to be able to do five images per second. Network time per picture, we're talking four milliseconds in and four milliseconds out. So total of eight milliseconds, uh, that being four megs at a thousand, yeah. So the blocking time on the network alone means that you can only have 125 queries per second. When we recall that we had 250 queries per second if we were purely going off the network inbound, so that's going to be five servers talking about the time at the I.O. it takes. So this is why you have to look at the different constraints and see where your bottleneck lies, because from the last slide, it would have been easy to say, oh, I, I need three servers. You actually need five servers, minimum. So moving on to the thumbnail service, which is serving much smaller packets of information, uh, you have about 50 QPS incoming like, requests for these thumbnails, and you're fetching 10 pictures at 256 kilobytes per result. That's about 145 megabytes per second. 
you're not going to be network bound on this particular service. However, I.O. So your storage read is 100 milliseconds because we're storing all of this recall in our magical database that keeps everything nice and consistent for us and means we don't have to pay for storage, which I appreciate in a network, in a storage service. The index service query, we'll talk about that in a little, set, in a little bit, but that's not going to be that slow. We're also assuming a very fast network inside of our data center. This is one of the reasons that it's good to keep it within your network control uh, as opposed to going back out over the internet or bouncing back off of the user's front end, the user's uh, client. So network time per results page, 2.5 milliseconds. The SLO time is 103 because we're just adding the 0.5 milliseconds of the index query, the 2.5 milliseconds of the network query, and the 100 milliseconds for the seek. That's well within our SLO, which, if you recall, was 250, I believe, for the thumbnail page. Mostly this is because we're doing all of these seeks in parallel, right? You're fetching 10 thumbnails, but you're doing it all at once. So the Remote storage-based um, time throughput here is not a problem. We can do 400 QPS. We only have 58. You won't need to scale up this server for a real long time. The download service is where we are fetching the single image, but at full quality. And this is your user has come in. They've clicked on their best friend's profile page. They've seen the first 10 pictures they posted recently. And they're like, I want to look at the one with the dog in it. Um, because why not? I hear some people are cat people. Eh, we can live and be friends. Um, so we're still assuming 58 QPS incoming for the full size pic, but each pic is four megabytes rather than the 10 times 256 kilobytes. But if you multiply that through, that's still well under the 1,000 megs per second that your NIC can handle. So we're not likely to have problems when it comes to network for that fetch. But let's have a look at the timing. So if we're looking at the 100 milliseconds RPC call to the back end and four milliseconds for fetching that data through, it's still really quick. It's well underneath our SLO. And the blocking time is still going to mean that we can serve all of those 58 QPS out of a single server. 58 is a pretty small QPS count, right? Um, that's not going to be a problem. And indexing service, this is the server that knows where your data is stored. So this isn't even really storing data, per se. It's got these tiny little 8 kilobyte payloads. We can probably rule of thumb, like, stick a finger in the wind. Network is not going to be a problem for this. If you wanted to max it out, you could. I'm not going to read all of these numbers to you. That's fairly intuitive. Um, for storage, though, you have to store eight kilobytes per image for 30 days of images uploaded at 50 pics for a, thousand, uh, for a million daily users. That's a fair bit of data, right? And you want this to be accessible um, and fast, preferably, because this is an index, right? You're going to be performing a lot of searches on this to find the matching images for your like best friend's 10 thumbnail page. So we're talking about 11 terabytes of data if you'll recall, we were offering you machines that could have up to four terabytes of HDD or two terabytes of SSD. Um, HDD is cheaper. Here is where I would do the maths against what my latency requirements are for my SLO and compare seek time for the thumbnails and say, do I really need anything faster than HDD? And I would say, for this, we don't. We are well under the timing SLOs in all of the examples we've worked through, we can spare two milliseconds per seek um, to deal with hard drive because it's significantly cheaper. And also, we need half as many servers. And this is where, if you were doing a much faster turnaround service with, with tighter latency requirements, you would make a different decision. There are no wrong decisions here. There's just trade-offs. As for the timing, uh, like we were saying, for the HDD, 
you already need at least three servers for uh, the data alone. So the fact that you need two servers to do it in time, it's eaten. Like this is not the bottleneck for that service. Um, and as we can see, the SSD, you could do all of the, the read access you need from one server. That's really gonna be overkill um, for this particular service. As for write QPS, um, this, on a throughput standpoint, is again going to be tiny amounts of data, um, and it's going to be a lot of queries. That's still the 579, that's the higher query count, but you can batch it up. Um, we didn't actually have an SLO for consistency, right? You have, if your best friend uploads a new picture of their puppy, you might not see it for five minutes. Um, we didn't spec out whether or not that's okay. If this was an actual product, I would probably want to talk to my product people and be like, do you need this to be instantaneous um, to be able to query these images that you've just uploaded? Or can we wait, can we batch them up? Because batching will make this a lot easier. So for the sizing, uh, we this is just a quick little table to compare all of those uh, constraints that we had earlier and make the trade-off that HDD is actually a better fit here. This is something that it's useful sometimes to draw up if you are specking out um, what you're buying um, so that you can show it to whoever's writing the check and say, no, I have reasons for why I'm asking for what I'm asking for. Hey, I could have been making you buy me six. Let's talk about the load balancer. Um, this is mostly going to be constrained um, by what's coming through it. So data-wise, your highest data throughput is going to be the uploads. These people take a heck of a lot of photographs. Who takes 50 photographs a day, every day, and uploads it? Um, these are like some power users. Every single one of our users is a power uploader. Um, maybe it's a photo backup store that you're using far more to store your pictures than you are for reading them. So if we're adding up all of the incoming data, we're gonna be having about 2,700 megabytes per second. So that's gonna be a minimum of three NICs for 3,000 megabytes per second. But this has not all been spec'd out. Um, cool. So if we're comparing all of the servers that we had in our diagram earlier, the total costs are going to be about 13 per data center if we're adding up each of them as bottlenecked by the constraint that was relevant to that service. And you will note that they are not all constrained on the same thing. If we had looked at this whole system design and said, oh, pictures are a lot of data, I bet you everything will be constrained by bandwidths and only calculated based on bandwidth, we would not have met our SLOs. So that's something to really keep in mind is that it's going to be individual to the service. Now, this has skipped over a lot of stuff that we as SREs like to think about, um, such as robustness. How many of you like running servers that run in precisely one instance, like our thumbnail service? You don't really need thumbnails, right? Yeah, one of my colleagues is like, he really likes to run single instance data centers. He likes living dangerously. Uh, I am not on his team. I do not like, who, who here likes living dangerously when it comes to your production services? Why is it all Googlers? I'm worried now. <laughs> well, okay, I promise you none of them work on cloud, so you lot are fine. Um, Redundancy. So we are talking about a service that will run in three data centers, right? So there's already redundancy in that aspect, but data centers that are geographically dispersed uh, are not going to give our users good latency. You really do want to have local redundancy as well, probably not to the full N plus two level, because you can still serve them from China or from Europe, like wherever your uh, actual DC is based if one of them is out for maintenance but it's still a good idea to never have single instances to always add. You'll note here we've added one. So if you have a machine go down, if you're running a live update, um, you shouldn't max out your capacity. Globally then, if we're talking 18 servers per cluster and then three DCs, that's a 54 server global footprint. That's not bad for a service with this amount of traffic. 
right? That's not a particularly high bill. Um, one thing I do see a lot is when people are designing a large-scale system, they will say, let's just add more servers and not actually sit down and do the maths about why they need the numbers that they need. And you can end up with a, lo a really low utilization that way. Um, but yeah, in reality, you can start with less and use auto-scaling. This um, really depends on how your launch is going as well, right? Are we certain that we're going to start out the gate with one million users? Okay, who, who here has ever run a launch with user interest? Who's had a success disaster? Yeah? So sometimes you really do need to start out the gate with this many servers, but it's not that often. So we can make a lot of improvements as well with caching. We've, had, we've not really talked about a very realistic service so far, right? Um, if we're talking about a photo streaming service, we're going to see some users are just more popular than others. Not everyone is Lady Gaga. Um, not every search is puppies, you know? Probably more people are hitting the sunshine hashtag than are hitting the multidimensional mathematics hashtag because people have poor taste. Um, <laughs> so it can be useful to think about strategic places in your system to insert performance caches. We have a lot of unused RAM in those servers that we bought. We have a lot of unused CPU. How can you better use that to decrease your bottlenecks? Um, can you serve extremely popular searches from the edge, right? Can you serve them in colos um, and avoid all of the high network throughput to fetch every image one by one? Um, yeah, tons of unexplored angles here, particularly um, outage management, right? Where in this service are the vulnerability points? If this server goes down, if the indexing server goes down, you can't get thumbnails and you can't get images and you can't upload anything. Oh no, the whole system is down. If you were actually designing this, that's a position you would go in and try to shore it up a little bit. But this is just a real quick and dirty overview of how you would go about specking out a system like this. And we really are focusing on running the numbers, being non-abstract, being very concrete. And I'm gonna pass that over to Ryan to finish it up. Thanks so much, Macy. Did anyone notice the uh, mistake in our solution? Yeah, what was it? Yes, I apologize for that. Our spec sheet had 10 gig ethernet on it and we used one gig in our calculations. Anyway, I'd just like to wrap up today. I hope you enjoyed um, this morning. I hope you found something useful, some useful takeaways from that, from the presentation. The slides are available, sorry, they will be available. They've been sent to Usenix. They'll be coming out with um, the rest of the conference. There is a link here for some further reading, and otherwise, you know, feel free to email me there. I'm rnt at Google. Could I just have all of the facilitators please stand up, if you're still in the room? Could I just get a round of applause to all these guys? They're all volunteers here um, to come along and do this for you, so it's not possible without these fellows that come along. Well, these people that come along. So thank you very much. Um, I think we're heading straight into lunch now and all of us are around for questions. Thank you.